Hello everybody, I'm Thomas Burkhart for NASA Spaceflight, and I'm here to talk with Jared Rook Isaacman and Scott Kidd Petit about the newly announced Polaris program. Now, Polaris is a new partnership with SpaceX for up to three human spaceflight missions, with the goal of demonstrating technologies and capabilities that will be used on future Moon and Mars missions. The program will actually culminate with the first crewed flight on Starship. Now, Jared and Scott are both on the crew of the first mission, Polaris Dawn, which is scheduled to launch on a Crew Dragon spacecraft as early as later this year. And that mission aims to break an altitude record set by the Gemini program, as well as conduct the first ever commercial spacewalk. Jared and, and Scott, thank you so much, both of you, for taking some time. Just a few questions about the Polaris announcement, which was really exciting. Um, first things first, you're building off of the Inspiration4 mission, which raised over $200 million for St. Jude. How is that effort going to be continuing for the Polaris program? Yeah, well, the, as, as we said, the conclusion of Inspiration4, you know, that, that work was, was not complete. Um, you know, that mission will always continue um, until, you know, St. Jude's vision of no child dying in the dawn of life is, is delivered upon. So I think what we're trying to do now, in addition to raising uh, funds, is, is bringing a little more attention awareness to their, to their global initiative. Um, you know, they've taken a lot of the, uh, lot of the funds that we raised as part of Inspiration4 and put it to the St. Jude Global Health Initiative. And what they're trying to do is take the protocols for their kind of life-saving um, treatments and, and in conjunction with other nonprofits uh, distributed across the world. Because right now the number one factor in childhood cancer survival rates is just simply where you're born in the world. Um, and there are plenty of parts of the, uh, of the world right now that have the same childhood uh, survival rates as what it was in the United States before St. Jude even existed, you know, more than 60 years ago. Uh, so it shouldn't be that way. Um, and, and if you think about it, some of the elements that were incorporating the mission, like uh, Starlink connectivity, can absolutely be used, um, you know, to connect, um, you know, some of the hardest places of the world to reach. And then through telemedicine, ideally, you know, get help to families that don't even realize they need the benefit of a St. Jude. Um, so I, I think like a lot of it is the same as before. Um, we need to, we need to do something about this. We have like a real, you know, real problem here on earth that we, we should be putting energy towards, but then also incorporating elements of our mission, like Starlink capability, uh, to spread the message globally. Also continuing from inspiration for you're carrying some scientific payloads on board Polaris Dawn, for example. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what field you're going to be looking at? Is it just health and medicine or are there other, some other scientific fields that will also be researched on this first mission? Yeah, so um, if you notice from our press release, we probably have three times the number of uh, education institutions we're working with uh, on this one compared to the one previously. And, and the benefit there is because we have multiple missions. So we're able to kind of go through a list um, of various science research, uh, tech demo experiments, and then prioritize which ones we think are, are best for, for this mission. Um, you know, for example, given just the, the target Apogee, um, you're probably going to prioritize for Polaris Dawn a lot more um, like radiation specific, um, you know, research experiments. Uh, so we have a number of those already in mind. In addition to, you know, kind of the, the bio, uh, like the biobank data that we were contributing from, from Inspiration4, that'll mm -hmm. of course be, be a component to it. But it's quite a bit. I don't know, Scott, if you, kid, you want to uh, layer in some more. No, I mean, initially, when we uh, started these conversations with the institutions um, and organizations um, to figure out what we could possibly accomplish, uh, we set some lofty goals. Uh, we wanted to identify uh, the biggest challenges associated with um, making space exploration more accessible, uh, especially for long duration space flight. Uh, so with regard to sands, um, you know, and, and numerous other uh, challenges with radiation. Uh, these organizations have now gone back and taken that as a, a challenge to figure out exactly what they could um, accomplish and task us to uh, work on and with, with regard to experiments during this mission. Yeah, I think one in particular that kids should talk about, which uh, they're talk, you know, at least from the, uh, the flight surgeon's um, perspective could be, you know, uh, you know, real groundbreaking work is um, intracranial pressure and the impact that that has on um, space adaptation syndrome and uh, actually some, you know, ocular related uh, issues. So you want to talk about how you're participating in that? <laughs> so I, I got I to gotta earn my keep on this mission. Um, so I volunteered myself to uh, participate. Uh, they're still going through the approval process regulatory uh, challenges associated with this. But, um, you know, up to this point, NASA has done a lot of testing with regard to ICP, uh, but it's been mainly pre and post flight uh, and mainly non-invasive. Um, what is being discussed now and we're working through, um, you know, this experiment is an invasive IC ICP experiment where they would uh, surgically implant a, a transducer 
um, below the rib cage with a catheter attached that goes into the spine, which ultimately measures um, cerebral flu fluid in the spine um, and see the effects of not only pre-flight, but during the mission itself, as well as post-flight uh, and the impact that micro and zero gravity have on, on the brain. My, myself and, the, uh, and Sarah and Anna are thrilled that uh, kid volunteered <laughs> this experiment specifically. Gotcha. Very cool. Um, you mentioned that there's three different missions, so more science opportunities. Uh, what kind of science capabilities are you expecting to be offered on missions two and three? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a good question. I mean, obviously, we're not going to be uh, as volume limited on Starship as we are on Dragon. Of course. Uh, you know, so if we're if we're looking at things that that might take up a little bit more space, we we'll probably shift that uh, a little bit to the right. Um, but, you know, as we as we learn from Polaris Dawn and as SpaceX learns from, you know, their Starship work in in Starbase, um, it's ultimately we're going to kind of combine that information to ultimately inform what the objective should be for uh, the second mission, which which I, I would think generally we're all going to revolve around de-risking ultimately the the first uh, human flight to Starship. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll kind of look at the list of, of science and research, which which is an ending. I mean, we have a dedicated director on the Polaris program who's solely working with uh, science and research institutions. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, once you have an announcement like today, the number of inbounds, in, you know, increases sure. substantially, um, which is fantastic because we've said the entire time, you know, myself and, you know, Kid as well as, you know, Sarah and Anna, um, like we should be giving every single minute we have on orbit uh, to these causes. And we should be debating like crazy, um, you know, from a prioritization perspective, what's making on the mission, you know, if the mission gets cut short, which are the ones we have to get accomplished? And then which ones can we shift to the, you know, to subsequent missions? So we're going to keep evaluating that throughout, you know, the entire Polaris program as more inbounds come in as well. And, you know, there's a significant operational flair to this mission and subsequent missions. Um, and, and that's where we want to leverage um, and benefit, you know, our quest for making space exploration more accessible to all. Uh, and, and these are necessary experiments, science and research uh, that's going to help move those needles. So, Jared, you're flying as a repeat astronaut and will be the first astronaut to fly on Dragon twice. Scott, this will be your first flight. However, you were heavily involved in Inspiration4. How does the preparations and the work you've already done on the Inspiration4 mission how, how has that prepared you for the upcoming Polaris flight? Well, if anything, observing Jared be taught and trained by Sarah has created a immense level of confidence uh, moving forward and being a part of, you know, now this side of the fence uh, as, as part of the crew. Um, I'm looking forward to every single element of, of the training that we're going to go through um, from the basic skill sets we're going to learn on the systems of, um, of Dragon and Falcon on into more of the subjective uh, training elements with uh, things that are specific to this mission with the EVA, with the altitude, with Starlink, and then ultimately the team building that has already started and will continue um, you know, throughout this entire process with the mountain climbing, with the fighter jet training. Um, it's just gonna be an awesome journey. Yeah, and honestly, I, I don't think you could outline uh, such an ambitious set of objectives for the first mission if you didn't have a crew with just a lot of background and experience already in this. I mean, mm -hmm. again, no one's more knowledgeable uh, going into this mission than Sarah and Anna. Um, you know, sure. they're just brilliant, um, unbelievable background, great engineers, very talented. They're gonna bring so much into this. Um, you know, I was fortunate to fly on, on Falcon and Dragon previously and, and Kid not only did he observe his mission director the whole way, I mean, he was there on, you know, in mission control throughout the duration of it. And what that allows us to do is focus on the things that, that haven't been done before. And there's quite a few of them uh, as it relates to, to Polaris Dawn. Um, and that's what's going to enable us to get it done within the time frames we've outlined. I am certainly the weak link and uh, need to start studying yesterday. <laughs> there you go. Uh, is Sarah still going to be heavily involved in astronaut training for this mission? Or will that go to someone else considering she's on the crew now? Yeah, I, I believe, I mean, she's, she's going to be on the crew. So right. um, uh, now I'm, I'm quite sure she's going to, she's going to be quite, she's going to be very familiar with the team that is going to be training us. But this is really important because regardless of our individual knowledge on this one, it's how we apply it as a team. Uh, it's so important. I mean, just got, having gone through this with inspiration for having four people, you know, in the simulator at the same time when something's going wrong so that we, and then seeing how everybody performs and anticipating each other's moves, um, like it's immensely beneficial. So regardless of any individual knowledge, past experience, getting together, truly training as a team um, is just vitally important for the mission. And, you know, I, I couldn't ask for a better scenario. I got a, a seasoned astronaut and I've got two of the, you know, experts as far as the train is concerned. And just like flying fighters, you know, you have an instructor 
other people can provide instruction within you know a mission or a, a training uh, event. Uh, so having you know all this uh, team uh, is going to help all of us come together and and train appropriately. So for the first mission, you're targeting a high apogee to get some high altitude, potentially break the Gemini program record. Um, and then you also mentioned that the spacewalk is going to take place at around 500 kilometers altitude. So is there dragon maneuvering between those two phases? Does that require an expendable Falcon launch? What's the flight profile look like for Dawn? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not planning an expendable uh, uh, booster flight, so it, it, it should absolutely be um, recovered. Um, yeah, you're just going to phase down in altitude. Um, I mean, it'll initially be like a, a highly elliptical orbit. Uh, you'll phase down to about 500 kilometers towards the latter part of the mission. And, um, and really what that'll do is just set us up well in the event, you know, anything unexpected happens uh, during an EVA, you're, you're going to want to be in a position to probably come home a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and that just preserves the most, you know, kind of um, the orbit opportunities for us. Okay. Uh, what crew member, if you can say, will be conducting the EVA? We, we don't know at this point. I mean, I, we're, we took advantage of the fact that we're all out here in Hawthorne to have another, you know, um, you know, kind of mission status meeting, and there's going to be a lot more of them. Um, there's just still a lot to learn. And I think what, what's going to happen is as we go through training, um, we're going to figure out, you know, um, you know, which crew members are, are going to be best to undertake that portion of it. The reality is like all four of us are are going to be, you know, in under pressurized operations uh, in a vehicle vented down to vacuum. Right. So, um, you know, it's going to take all four of us uh, to, to kind of get through that, that objective specifically. And you just want to put the, the right people in the right places to increase chances of success. Gotcha. And then uh, let's see here. Uh, was there any talk for when planning for this EVA? And maybe this is also still in work versus some type of trying to put an airlock in Dragon? Or was it always, we, you know, you have to do a full deep press kind of system and as training for that procedure already started? Yeah, I mean, we 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 did not anticipate uh, putting an airlock. I think the idea is to, you know, like again, the whole kind of game plan is to work towards Starship. So you're you're undertaking building blocks with the vehicle and, and generally the capabilities you have today to inform, you know, safe operations of of Starship. So you're going to learn from this to affect that design, not really, um, you know, change Dragon. And um, sorry, they, I guess the second what was the second part of your question. Was oh. this training has training for that for EVA stuff already started? Yeah, uh, we've already done some work actually already. Um, you know, um, I, I was able to suit up again in my uh, Inspiration Four suit, and uh, I think I look like a robot, uh, fully pressurized. But um, um, yeah, no, we actually, uh, you know, we have no intention to use that suit. But the idea we can obviously learn from it and, and ultimately, you know, maybe inform some of the design changes on the um, on the EVA suit we will fly with. Yeah, in standard SpaceX fashion. Um, they're taking it to the nth level as far as making sure that we are full uh, with the training for uh, the EVA. Uh, they're discussing suspension systems. You know, we've discussed uh, other opportunities um, with um, uh, MBL. You know, we'll, we'll figure it out, and they're working through the syllabus now. Um, but but again, we we got the confidence necessary uh, that the team's going to put together the right training plan for us. Uh, you mentioned the first mission is supposed to last up to five days. You mentioned that the EVA is obviously a factor towards the end of the mission. What other factors might influence the actual length of uh, the Dawn mission? Weather, for sure. Okay, cool. I mean, that's that's um, the biggest factor that we can't hang out at the space station. We have limited life support consumables, and we're going to use up a lot of them uh, when we vent down a vacuum and repress. So I think the idea is not nominal mission duration should be five days. And then based on, you know, experiences, we can, we can flex. Okay, cool. So Jared, are you planning on flying and or commanding all three missions or is that still under discussion? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, the large parts can depend how this first mission goes. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I think during the press conference, you know, none of us were signed off for, for human space flight until about eight days prior to the launch of inspiration Four. um, you know, we're graded through this. Uh, so hopefully we, we undertake a really good mission and then, um, can have the opportunity to continue uh, to continue to participate. Can you speak to any of the technology demonstrations? You mentioned a couple. I know one was through Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. There were some other uh, uh, already named organizations that have tech demonstrations. Can you speak to what those will be? I think the game plan is, and, and just also because we have limited time today, we're, we're going to do a whole science tech uh, research update um, and, and kind of double click on, on every one of them. Um, we're actually still doing somewhat of a prioritization exercise to determine if some of these do fit, you know, on Polaris Dawn or, or should be bumped to another mission. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'd hate to go into too much specifics and find out it's going to go 
go on another mission, but um, sure. we, we are trying to maximize every every minute we, we literally have on orbit. Gotcha. And then for just each of you, uh, what is the most exciting thing about Polaris Dawn and the Polaris program overall to both of you personally? I got to say the crew, the team. Um, it's it's not only the four guy, uh, the four uh, crew members, but it's it's everyone. Um, it's everyone behind the scenes. It's our embedded team uh, of directors that are you know the utmost professionals uh, that we relied upon during Inspiration Four, and obviously um, everyone here at SpaceX. Um, uh, we couldn't be more proud to be in this partnership with them, uh, and it's going to be just an awesome journey from beginning to end. I, I think it's what it all what it all means uh, when we get through this. You, you know, uh, so for example, we were just as as uh, Kid mentioned, we were just up in the uh, the suit lab here, right? And uh, I was more excited by the fact that they were working on an EVA suit than the operational implications of it. Like, what does this mean that you're building a spacesuit? It means people are going to start doing spacewalks. It means we're that much closer to, you know, getting to the moon and Mars. Now, now if the, when the Polaris program ends, if it's successful, it means human beings are flying on starships. And if, and if you've gotten to that point, I mean, you're going back to the, to the moon. And if you can get to the moon, it, it's, it's, it's not much more after that to get to Mars. So, um, yeah, I, I think just like with Inspiration4, I mean, I was, I was always excited. Like, if we get this right, think of all the, the fun missions to follow, all the exciting missions to follow. Well, now it's like if, when, when, the, when the chapter closes on the Polaris program, it means we're ready for the moon. That's, that's pretty, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> That is incredible. Both of you, thank you so much for your time today. I think we're kind of running short here. So yeah, I think we got to wrap up. I'm sorry we cut it a little, we were a little late for you on that, but we'll, we'll, we'll connect throughout the whole, uh, whole program. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good luck to you both and as well as Sarah, Anna, and I'm very excited to hear about this and excited to talk about it more soon. Yes, yeah, sounds thank great. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both.